Good morning. Welcome. Oh, welcome. Um, I'm sorry. I had a piece of gum in my mouth. I'm trying to get rid of it. Um, we do welcome you all to the village. I know yesterday was a busy day up here, and uh, Vivian, I'm just amazed you're sitting here this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it was wonderful and, and I had full intents of coming, but um, in our announcements this morning, I can give you the reason it didn't happen. Um, some of you know, uh, if you do not know, our sweet Melissa, who is trying to get over a broken ball in her shoulder, uh, the the femur is that correct I don't know my biology very well anyway this this ball right here has was cracked she fell and then she sent me a message Friday night Friday night and told me she's in the ER but not to say anything and then Friday uh, she got admitted so I went to see her Saturday she's still telling me not to say anything to anybody so I went to see her Saturday and I thought what she'd done was messed up her shoulder again, that she had fallen and messed up. No, she fell and her face looks like she was drug through a field or something. Uh, it's ugly, but she says it doesn't hurt. But she fell and gravel and she cracked her pelvic bone. Is that the way y'all understood it? And um, so I asked her yesterday, I said, well, you're going to be gone a long time, and people are going to think you left if I can't tell them what's going on. <laughs> and so she has given me permission to tell you that all of that has happened. And I think uh, Bill and Pam have talked with her, and I think we, we are in agreement. We talked this morning. I think her biggest prayer request from us right now, she's going to be dismissed to rehab. There is apparently a rehab center attached to Rowan Hospital. And her biggest fear right now is that she will be sent somewhere outside the hospital and have to get into an ambulance and have to go over railroad tracks. She just is, we're, we're praying that she gets admitted to that rehab at the hospital and all they have to do is wheel her down the hallway and have a lot less disruptions on that hip. So if you'll keep Melissa in prayer, that's what's going on and I will keep everyone posted when she finally gets settled somewhere. Uh, she's still in the hospital right now, I want to say I'm not going to say. I think it's 345 is her room number right now. But that will probably change. She's supposed to be discharged Monday. So when she gets settled somewhere, I'll let everybody know where she is. <clears throat> also, if you would look at your bulletin, uh, the hymns of praise, love divine, all loves excelling. The correct number is on the board, 384. So don't look at your bulletin when we get ready to sing that song. Y'all have a lousy secretary, and if I were y'all, I would, I would work on finding a new one because this happens too often. Um, but Carolyn thinks everything else in the bulletin's okay. It was just that one song. I really need to send the bulletin to Carolyn to look over because she can catch those, those musical mistakes before I print. Uh, are there any other announcements for this morning? I have another one. It's that time of year again, school is starting. And what they need are unisex shorts and long pants from ages five, probably to eight or nine, when children have accidents and parents cannot be contacted by phone. They need something in stock and they have run out of just play shorts and play pants. I will put this in the uh, vestibule, and if we could get it filled up by the end of August, then I can get it to them the 1st of September. Um, so when you go into Family Dollar or Walmart, these don't have to be Under Armour, high dollar expensive, don't go to belts, because they're just gonna wear them 
just long enough to get through the school day, <laughs> and then they'll go home. But but um, the school does not have it, that's that's what they're very low on right now are some shorts and long pants, and of course if if you start getting pink, that excludes any little boys. So they ask for unisex colors, um, and I think that's all of my personal. Um, announcements that I needed to make. Are there any others? Do we have any prayer requests or praise reports? Y'all are awfully quiet this morning. Well, um, our friend Jason Hamill, he comes here once in a while. His brother Kevin comes a lot. Um, he is, he is getting ready to have rotator cuff surgery this week, and he has asked that we pray for him. And so I got that too late to put into the bulletin. So um, the two new bulletin on the back of your bulletin, if you would just um, add Jason Eller up above Melissa's name. Um, and he didn't tell me what day he was having surgery this week. And I don't think he's really worried about it. I think he's just, he's just ready to get back to work and get back to a normal life. And so main thing is that just no complications come from it. That it's, and I've had that surgery before and it, it wasn't the worst thing I've ever had done. But you do have to heal. You do have to do a little rehab for it. So those are my, David, have we got any prayer requests? Oh, I did. Well, you know what? My people love me enough that they understand. They can read my mind. Please write Jason Hamill on the back of your bulletin above the name of Melissa Eller. All right. Well, if we've got all of our announcements and prayer requests, uh, we did have two have a request from the uh, prayer shed this morning. Uh, please hold Gary Duff. Please pray that, that Gary Duff gets disability and that Charles Braun gets to feeling better and uses less alcohol. And... Jennifer, somebody, needs a new partner. That's... And this is by the same person. Uh, pray that we all get into a productive life. So there's a lot not being said on this prayer request. And so let's remember... Um, William and Gary and Charles and Jennifer in our prayers. <clears throat> if you are able, will you stand and join us in our call to worship on page 389?
Christians and were adopted by God our Father, our Abba Father. I will be reading from Romans chapter 8 and I'll be reading verses 12 through 17. So then brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you will put to death the deeds of the body and the flesh, and you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And if in fact we suffer with him, so we may also be glorified in him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. Loving Father, we come to you this morning as free people, free from our debts, free from our sins, free from the wrongs of the past. We thank you that you have adopted us and have brought us in to this salvation by the death of your precious Son. Father, we are not worthy Every night we say our prayers asking for forgiveness and the next day we get up and we just about do it all again. Help us, Lord, to stay centered in your will and to sin less and less and to become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, who is perfect. As we now call him brother and you call us your children, let us be worthy of those titles. Lord, help us to, to understand what being born again is about. To understand what Paul meant when he talked about you adopting us. To understand what calling on the name of Jesus really means. Father, we have people that do not know your name, living in cr close proximity. Help us to live in a way that they can see Jesus Christ in us and they can hear his voice through us. Help us, Lord, to be kinder and gentler people as we go through this world, as we go through our days. Help us to stop and pray for that person that looks a little lost. Help us to never pass up an opportunity that you give to us to be a brother and sister to your children. And Father, we ask special prayers this morning for Jason and for Melissa as they are facing medical issues and they are going to need healing and rehab and so we ask that you be with them we ask that you be we, we are thankful and we lift up praises that um, Melissa is not going to have to go through any kind of chemo or radiation from her last visit to the doctor that things seem to be well in that, or, in that regards. Lord, we still pray for the missing children. We pray for children that are being abused. And, and we pray that our church will open up our eyes and try to figure out what it is we can do to help these children that are being used in, in human trafficking and, and abused in just horrendous ways. 
Father, we pray for the family who lost the, the mother and the three-year-old and nine-month-old child that got washed out of the car and they still have not found the baby. There is a daddy and grandparents somewhere grieving terribly. And so we lift them up to you, Father, and all those that have been affected by the floods and the heat over the past couple of weeks. The heat is so unsafe for children and the elderly. So we ask that you keep this nation, keep your hand on this nation, and, and keep your people safe from harm, whether it's floods, tornadoes, heat, just keep us safe and help us to make good decisions to keep ourselves safe. Father, we are moving into tumultuous political times and it seems like it gets worse and worse every year. Help us to just be Christians when it comes to political talk around the table. Help us to remember that you love everyone on every side of every issue. And if we need to tell your story, help us to do that. But mainly help us to just be polite, as my mama would say, if you got nothing good to say, don't say anything at all. Lord, tighten up our filters so we can just love one another. I ask you, Lord, to be with Glenna and Shirley and all those that are lonely today. I ask you to be with all that are traveling today. Um, I know that my son and Lindsay are, are traveling to see her brother and, and there are others on the road. So we ask that you just have travel mercies for all that have to be somewhere besides here right now. And Lord, we have many things we want to lift up to you personally. And at this moment, I ask that you hear us all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now we come to you, Father, with the greatest prayer ever, better than any preacher could ever preach. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. If our, I think I'm looking to make sure I'm saying it right. Yes, if our usher would come forward. If the preacher would stop rearranging the order of worship, she'd know what to do next. Father God, open our hearts to give back to you that which you gave to us to begin with. Amen.
Will you pray with me and for me? O oh, merciful God, may the words of our lips and the meditations of our hearts be pure and holy in your sight. These things we ask in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I need to give uh, notice to you that my eighth grade Latin has left my mind. And um, there's a few words that I'm going to butcher. So if you're very, very good at Latin, I don't want to hear about it. Don't come up and tell me what words I mispronounced at the end. I'm, I'm giving you a heads up right now. I'm going to probably butcher some Latin. Because I tried to even, David is my witness, I tried to even go to the pronunciation dictionary and they didn't want to, want to interpret Latin for me for some reason. So anyway, we're going to muddle through this. But I do think that before we dive in to today's scripture and message uh, that Paul gave to us this morning, I think there's a few things that we need to, to think about and we need to set our minds back about two or three thousand years ago. You know, I've always told you we can't read the scripture with today's mindset. There, there's a reason that some things were said in our Bible that were said. And, and so I want us to gain an understanding of a little bit about what Paul was talking about. Um, adoption, and that word was in our scripture, adoption under Roman law looked a whole lot different than adoption does today. Today, uh, a, a mother and or father either become unwilling, or I mean not unwilling, but unable to raise their child and they'll let a grandparent take over or sister or brother or uh, there are girls that get pregnant and they're just not ready to, to, to raise a baby and they'll put them up for adoption and, and people that are wanting children will go through the process of adoption. And, and we've all heard these stories of adoption and, and, and that's today's adoption. But, but in Roman law, 3,000 years ago, it looked much, much different. Um, the words that Paul uses here really are not as powerful, I don't think, without this understanding. So I'm going to do something that I don't like to do, and that's do some explaining before I start preaching. Uh, I, I don't like when preachers, that's a pet peeve of mine, but I really do think it's important that we understand what's going on here. Paul is introducing to us uh, another one of his great metaphors. Uh, Jesus used parables. Paul liked to use metaphors. And in this metaphor, he's describing our relationship of the Christian to God. And the relationship that he's using here is uh, of the Christian being adopted into the family of God. And, and we've heard that term used all through the New Testament. And I think that every time Jesus used it or one of the disciples, I think this is what they were talking about. Uh, because it just makes more sense when I think about being adopted by God, that this is what Jesus meant when, when he said that. This is a very serious and complicated uh, process that, that the Romans used for adoption. And, um, and, and I think it's really going to put a lot of depth into this scripture for us. So just bear with me. Roman adoption has always been rendered as a serious and much more difficult by what they call the patria potestas. That means the power of the father. And this was the, what this meant was the power that the father had over his family. It was a power of absolute um, disposal and absolute control of what, what the family was going to do next. Um, and, and in the early days, it even could have, have, it was sometimes used as a power of, of life and death. So it, it, was a, it was a strong power that a father had over his family. <coughs> In regards to his father, a Roman son 
never comes to age. Can you imagine that today where all the young boys are saying, just wait till I turn 18? That never happened. The, as long as daddy was living, the Roman son never came to age, which meant that he was always living under the patria potestas, the power of his father. <coughs> Excuse me. This obviously, because of this, this patria potestas, this obviously made adoption to another family a very difficult and a very serious step. In adoption, a person had to pass from one patria potestas to another patria potestas. So, so just because the son leaves his family, he's, he's not really getting the freedom that, that you and I enjoy today. And there are two steps in this ceremony of adoption. The first step, and this is the one I'm just going to really butcher. Mancia patio, I believe is how to say that. Um, and that, that um, part of the ceremony was to, meant to take hold, to take hold of. And it, and it was ca carried out by a symbolic scale. I think of, you know, those scales that, that here's the column and they're here and you put something on each side and it goes up till it's level and, and so then you know that you've paid the right amount of money for however many grams of, of figs you had in there. So this, what this is, is they, they've got the scales <coughs> and the father sells his son but then symbolically, he comes back with copper and he puts it on the scales and it levels up and he buys him back. And he does that two times. Well, actually he does it three times. He buys him back twice, but the third time he does not buy him back. <coughs> so now at this moment, the patrio potestas is broken. At this very second, the sun is under no one's power. However, there's a second part to this ceremony called the vendactio, and that means to claim. So the adopting father, he comes to the prayer tour, one of the Roman magistrates, <coughs> and he has to present a legal case for the transference of the person to be adopted. <coughs> This was a very serious, serious ceremony of adoption. But the consequences of this adoption are most significant for the picture that Paul is trying to paint to all of us that we are being adopted by God. There's four main parts to this ceremony. First, the adopted person lost all rights to the old family. <coughs> and gained all the rights of a legitimate, as a legitimate son of a new family. And the most, in the most binding and legal way, the son gets a new family or a new father. And that is followed that, that he is, he's now going to become heir to this new father's estate, losing everything to his, from his old father. Even if sons are born after his adoption, he was the first son, and he will still be the single heir to that father's property. <coughs> I'm so sorry. In law, the old life of the adopted person was completely wiped out. And this is what I think is the most important part of this. Anything that person did before, good, bad, or ugly, it is totally wiped out. <coughs> he does not have the privilege of anything he would have received from his father. However, if he has any date, uh, debts, those are all wiped clean too. Anything he ever did wrong before, it's forgotten. It's gone. He was regarded as a new person when he leaves this old relationship and moves into this new relationship. What does that sound like? Doesn't that kind of sound like 
being born again, being saved by a wonderful Savior. He went into a new life <clears throat> where the past had nothing to do with him anymore. And this is what's important for us to understand, that nothing, nothing that he did was charged against him before he went into this new family. And finally, the fourth thing that Paul wants us to remember is that in the eyes of the law, he was absolutely the son of the new father. And Roman history, I think any of y'all that have had any history at all of world history, you're going to remember this. Roman history gives us a really good example of this. We all remember <clears throat> the Emperor Claudius. And for whatever reason, he didn't have any sons. Um, and he had daughters, but he didn't have any sons. And in order that he would have a male heir to his throne, he went and um, uh, adopted Nero. Well, we all remember Nero. What a great guy he was. But he had absolutely no blood, no DNA. There was no relationship at all between him. However, because of this adoption, he was the heir. He was as if he was the firstborn son to Claudius. <clears throat> Now, Claudius had a daughter that we remember as Octavia. And Nero wanted to cement this relationship, this standing that he had in line of royalty. And so he wanted to marry Oct uh, Octavia. Now, Nero and Octavia were brother and sisters because of the law. Because Nero was no longer a part of his family. He was the son of Claudius. So they can't get married. But what happened is Claudius went, pulled the Roman Senate in, <clears throat> held a special legislation. We're all familiar with those special legislations now, aren't we? And he held a special legislation and got permission for Nero and Octavia to be married. So that's the history of Nero. And, but it shows you how important this adoption was that these two people that did not have a drop of blood, they could not get married because now legally they were brother and sister until this special council was called and they did get married. <clears throat> There's one more part of this uh, adoption ceremony. Um, if, if you've got your Bibles open or if you remember I said that God's witness was the Holy Spirit. Well, when this Roman adoption would take place, they had to have seven witnesses. And they had to have that because people were just as honest back then as they are today. And if something would have happened to the father that adopted this son, people could come up and say that that's not really his son. And the, 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 heir, the heir should be this, this daughter or it should be the second son. Or, so they had to have seven witnesses so that if something happened, one of these witnesses could come forward and say, no, it was a legal adoption, and he is his father, his son. Today, we don't have to have seven witnesses to come forward and testify that we have been adopted by God. We have one witness, and that's the Holy Spirit, and he is never going to not stand on our side, that we are adopted by God. So what Paul is saying here, I think, is that the Holy Spirit himself is the witness to our adoption into the family of God. We don't need human beings to let us know who we are. God has told us, you are my child. I have adopted you into my family. And it was witnessed by the Holy Spirit. It was meaningful in the mind of Paul when he transferred this picture of our adoption into the family of God from the picture of Roman adoption, which is the only adoption that he understood and knew. That once we were <clears throat> under the absolute control of our own sinful nature, that God in his wonderful mercy and grace has brought us to this absolute possession of being his child. 
our old life, just like the son that left his debts behind <clears throat> that were wiped out. Our old life of sins and mistakes and disobedience have no more rights over us when we become followers of Christ because God is our patre potes. Our God is our power. The past is canceled. And I think that's hard for us to understand. God, you know what I did in 1982. How can you forgive me of that? And... God says, I forgave you for that about 40 years ago. Will you just let it go? <laughs> and we have a hard time letting go of our sins. I mean, am I the only one that has that problem? Please, if you remember your old sins, raise your hand and let me know I'm not the only one. I, I, it's, just, it's just hard. And if we can't let go of it, it's hard to understand how God lets go of it, right? And so we just go back and forth in circles. But that's not the way it is. We have begun a new life with God. He has adopted us. Our old life sold us three times. And the third time, God stepped in and he bought us with his life. He didn't use copper. He didn't even use diamonds. He used his life. And so that we become joint heirs with Jesus Christ, God's own son. That which Christ inherits, we also inherit. If Christ had to suffer, we are going to also inherit in that suffering. But if Christ was raised to life and to glory, we also inherit that life and glory. Because we are his brothers and sisters. If your Bibles are open, if you look at verses 12 and 13, Paul begins to make a contrast against two ways of living, which consequently have two outcomes. If you're going to live... According to the flesh, your, your life is going to end in death, and that's going to be the end of it. <clears throat> While living in the power of the Spirit, your death is only going to lead to a better life. So what does that mean besides the obvious? Well, living according to the flesh, we have to remember that what Paul is talking about is living for that which is temporary, pursuing self-interest and selfish desires, even sometimes at the expense of others, and ignoring the presence of God in our life, in our daily walk. It's sort of like working and thinking about what we today call creature comforts, things we don't really need. Um, it, it's it's uh, like I, I, I was reminded this weekend of uh, John Wesley when he, became, when he got out of school and he was hired as a professor and he made 28 pounds a year, well, or 30 pounds a year, but it only took him 28 pounds a year to live. And so he lived on 28 pounds a year and he gave those other two pounds away to the poor. And then um, in a few years, he got a raise to 60 pounds a year. Well, he didn't see any point in living beyond 28 pounds a year. He still got what he needed with 28 pounds a year. So he lived on 28 pounds a year and he gave all the rest of it to the poor, to the churches. And it's so on and so on. He got up to 90 pounds, but he always to the day he died lived on 28 pounds a year. He did not live an extravagant life. He did not seek the creature comforts that I am so guilty of. Um, and I won't ask you to raise your hand for that. I'm very guilty of pursuing self-interest and creature comforts. I mean, I make y'all turn on the air conditioning for heaven's sakes. But <clears throat> we go for these creature comforts sometimes and we don't even think about God and what we could be doing for God with the creature comforts that we are pursuing. This is the flesh that Paul is talking about. He's not talking about this flesh that sticks to our bones and our muscles. He's talking about the human tendency to seek and to possess all that it brings, immediate and imminent satisfaction to one's own selfish desires and without regard for spiritual viewpoint. The consequence of this way of living is death. 
And, and I don't want to know what that death encounters. I mean, we see you know, fire and um, other visuals in the Bible. I, just, I, don't, I don't want to even think about what it could be. I just want to know where I'm going and that's not going to be there. So I don't want to live according to my flesh because I don't want to die and go somewhere that's not going to be heavenly. The term death in this context does not mean a physical death. By dying of the self, when we, when we can put all those creature comforts and our selfish desires behind us as God intends us to be, it's a spiritual death not to live as God has willed us to live. So if we can let all that go, that's the death that Paul's talking about. Live for God. Don't live for... And, and I, I say all this, and, and I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't think that God has a problem when we have worked hard and, you know, we build ourselves or buy ourselves a nice home to live in. I'm talking about excess. And, and I don't think any of y'all do that. I haven't heard about any of y'all flying out to Nevada to try to win the jackpots and all the, I'm talking about stuff that's not necessary in life. I'm not talking about what we need, roof over our head and that kind of stuff. And I think that's what Paul's talking about. Pe people were extravagant back then. People spent money on stuff that they didn't need. <clears throat> so Paul is telling us to put, put those desires that are not gonna make our life any better or anyone else's life any better, put those to a side, die to that, so that you can live for God. Paul associates the body with human weakness. It's, and, I, and this is why he didn't get married, one of the reasons that, that um, theologians believe he didn't get married. It is mortal, and although the body itself is not sinful, it is the place where sin seeks to have dominion. This is why we as Methodists have an open table, open doors, open hearts to anybody that wants to come and worship with us. And if they don't want to come here and worship with us, maybe we need to go out and worship with them. We believe that a person is God's child, that a person is not sin. But sometimes sin gets inside of us and it causes us to do sinful things. But you will never hear God say that a person is sin because none of us are sin. We just do sinful things sometimes. And because of our body and because of that selfish desire that, that confronts us sometimes, it opens us up to failure and corruption. But Paul is so very confident that the believer can be put to death of all of these things that we don't need to be a kingdom builder for God that are sinful by the Spirit, that the consequence of living is that life is found, if you look at verse 13, at the end of that verse, he says, you will live. And that is our promise from our Heavenly Father God that adopted us, our Abba Father. You will live, and you will live abundantly. You are going to live with me. Paul's talking about that that is truly what life is, and that God intends for us, his own, to be led by the Spirit. His disciples, his apostles, his kingdom builders. He wants us to, to follow the Spirit, and, and the Spirit will guide us. It's, it's uh, also a, a life that has an ethical significance. Paul says in Galatians 5.25 that if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. We can't be guided by the Spirit I mean, we can't live by the Spirit if we're not allowing that Spirit to guide us. And, and we can't allow that Spirit to guide us if we don't every day get up and put on the full armor of God and ask the Holy Spirit, fill me up. I love the song, fill my cup, Lord. We should have sung that today. Uh, fill me up. 
Fill me up and, and, and fill me with the Holy Spirit and don't leave one trace of Beverly left behind because that's where me and you gonna get in trouble. When, when Beverly thinks that she has got it together. No, I don't. I have to be filled with the Spirit. In verse 14, Paul tells us that those that are led by the Spirit are children of God. And that's what I want to hear at the end of my life. If anybody says anything about me at a funeral, I want them to say she was loved by God and she loved Jesus. And I don't care if anybody says anything else. That is all I won't say. And you just remember that, David. God loved me so much that he sent his son to die for me so that I can live a life worthy of being with him forever. <clears throat> Children that have an intimate relationship with God, it's comparable to children that have a great relationship with their mother or father. In the next two verses of Romans in 15 and 16, Paul is basically telling the believer, telling us that the believers are persons that have received the Holy Spirit. That's what I was just talking about. In 1 Corinthians, he tells us that whoever confesses Jesus as Lord does so by the power of the Spirit. You understand, we don't have any power. <clears throat> we don't have power in our baptism. We don't have power in, at the communion table. We don't have power in our relationship with God. It is all through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus loves us enough to leave that Spirit with us so that we can be all-powerful and use His power. The person that has already been adopted as God's children and the Holy Spirit is our witness. By faith, by baptism, and through the power of the Spirit, we have a new relationship with God. We have been adopted. And whatever we did in 1982 is no longer hanging over us. Just like the son that got adopted to a new patre potus. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul said, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. If you remember, those were the words Jesus used on the cross, Abba. Abba is an Aramaic term, Aramaic term for father, and it's the word that, that we always, or I always, do relate it to that crucifixion scene. In, in Mark chapter 14, Jesus says, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Who as a child did not think that their daddy could do anything? I'm one of those little girls. I thought my dad was the greatest hero ever. I, I just didn't think there was anything that my daddy couldn't do. Now, that has been transferred to David. I just don't think there's anything that he can't do. And Jonathan and Charles are starting to move up on that scale also. But we all have somebody in our life, usually our father, that we think can just do all things. The difference here with us and that crucifixion scene is that Jesus knew that his father could do all things. That's different than thinking your daddy can do all things. His Abba could do all things for him. And now, as his adopted children, we all have the same access to Jesus' Abba that he had. A final verse in our readings in verse 17 has two conditional clauses to it. And if, children, if, if we are children of God, then we are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. And in fact, we suffer with him so that we might be glorified with him. Have you ever thought of yourself as suffering like Christ and being glorified like Christ? That's, that's a lot. That's a heavy, heavy yoke for us Christians to carry on us, that we are suffering the same as Christ. I have not suffered like Christ suffered, but that in my sufferings in life, I am going to be glorified with him 
one day. The first of the conditions has already been established. We are children of God. Amen? And the good news attached to that is that we are heirs of the promises of God in Christ. Christ himself was an heir of those promises which were spoken to the King, to the Messiah of Israel, beginning with David, declaring that he was the Son of God in Samuel and Psalms and, and, and lots of verses in the Old Testament. And if Christ, the son of David, because he was descended from King David, is an heir of God, then all those who are in Christ are joint heirs with him. All the blessings coming upon Christ are shared with those who are one with him. So finally, we see and we understand Paul's picture <clears throat> that when a person became a Christian, when we are adopted, we are adopted into the very family of God. And it was no small thing for us to be adopted into God's family. We did nothing to deserve it. God, the great Father, in his amazing love and mercy, has taken the lost and the helpless and the poverty-stricken, the debt-laden sinner, and said, leave all that behind. Come to me. I am now your father, and you have been adopted into my own family. So that the debts that were ever in your life, and even all of those debts that you are going to commit in the future, they are all canceled out. And all of my glory you will inherit. Amen. If you are able, will you stand and join me on page 399? And let us once again, if you haven't, you can stand where you are and just ask God to take your life and let it be for Him, not for us, not for our human comforts, but let's let it all be for God. <clears throat>
Father, we do ask that you take us, take all of us, remove any part in us that we are holding back. Let us be for you. Let us live the life.